Cardiac arrest. We have a working fire. Whole traffic shots fired. Would you mind sharing a little bit about the other major character, so to speak, the brainchild and this this confluence events that brought people like John Moon uh, together under you know the father of the CPR? Would Would you mind talking about that other main character that you kind of go into to set the stage for the history of Freedom House later in the book? Yeah, I assume you're talking about Saffer. Yeah, Peter Saffer. Um, so Peter Saffer is this uh, Austrian-born anesthesiologist. Um, came from uh, uh, Vienna, a very educated family. Both of his parents were doctors. His mother had Jewish ancestry, so when the Germans rolled into Austria, their future was kind of um, a question mark. Uh, They weren't exactly sure what that was going to mean for them. Um, Nothing good, uh, go figure, uh, came of it. They and his father sort of resisted um, and lost his job because of uh, his mother's Jewish ancestry. She lost her job. And he, you know, he, he nearly is drafted into the German army, he has to you know, smear himself with this chemical that produces this terrible reaction that gets him hospitalized, uh, but it keeps him from, from being sent to the Eastern Front, which at that point was, you know, I mean, that's one of history's great meat grinders, you know, I mean, yeah. it's practically a death sentence. But he gets eventually gets a medical discharge and spends the rest of the war in a hospital, finishes his medical school, um, comes to the U.S. to study at Yale, and he thinks he's going to be a surgeon. And it's there that he encounters anesthesiology and realizes this is a field that's brand new. Um, and this is something that, you know, I could make a mark in. By the early 50s, he's moved to Baltimore, and it's there that he comes across a study that says expired air contains enough oxygen to keep somebody alive. In other words, I can breathe into your mouth and keep you alive. Mm-hmm. And so he knows that, you know, CPR or rescue breathing at the time, it's, the, you know, essentially what they would do is you flop a guy in his face, you press on his back, you wiggle his arms. You see if that did anything. Of course it, it didn't do anything. It looked like and wrestling you, more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the most ridiculous thing. And then you do it again, hoping for a different outcome, which of course never comes. So Saffer marries that study with what he sees as a totally useless form of rescue breathing, um, which is essentially trying to compress the lungs so that when they re-expand, oxygen sort of accidentally goes in. Mm-hmm. And um, he, he, he goes into an OR at Baltimore City Hospital uh, at, on the weekends. They don't operate on the weekends. He gets a bunch of volunteers, and he says to them, All right, here's what I'm going to do. We're going to go into this empty OR, and I'm going to sedate you and paralyze you. And you're going to lie on the ground for eight hours. And I'm going to use this method, which we know um, doesn't work. And I'm going to have you connected to a bunch of devices to measure how much air is in your blood, how much tidal volume you're getting through this ridiculous process, uh, which we which we know is useless. And when you start to die, I'm going to record that. I'm going to have I'm going to I'm going to have it noted that this isn't working, and you aren't getting enough oxygen, and you're becoming hypoxic. And then when you reach dangerous levels. I'm going to usher in some people who have no idea what they're doing, um, some of whom are Boy Scouts who have never had any kind of medical training, and I'm going to give them a 30-second uh, crash course on how to do rescue breathing, and then they're going to keep you alive for the rest of the time that you're sedated. And yeah, where do I sign up? It. Where do I sign up for this? I, seriously, right? Like the worst sales pitch of all time. But you know, I mean, that's I guess the beauty, uh, the beautiful thing about medical community is that there are people who really believe. And so there are people who know he's right and they sign on, thankfully. Makes me wonder um, about the first hazmat teams. Well, we're going to develop all of these different suits and we're going to put you near all this stuff and we'll see how that works. <laughs> we're going to squirt all this all over you and just see how it goes. If you melt, we know it's no good. It's crash yeah. crash uh, dummies with live dummies. <laughs> <laughs> That's, yeah. I mean, he basically recruited crash test dummies. Um, and, you know, of course he, he runs his, his test. He does 40 of them. He gathers all of his data. He presents it to the world in Los Angeles, and that's it. You know, people see it, and they and they it, it is immediately recognized as the success that we know it to be. He pairs that with chest compression, and boom! In one fell swoop, you have CPR. Travels around the world, teaching people, proselytizing, and could have retired right there. And mm-hmm. it's been a wild success by any measure, but he doesn't. He then moves to Pittsburgh. So you have this guy who, you know, narrowly escapes World War II. And he emerges with the sense of like, well, if I survive when millions die, then I need to make my 
living worthwhile. So I need to do something. And you would think creating CPR would be enough of a something, but for him, it's not. He needs to keep going. So he's driven. He's clearly brilliant. He's fearless. He's now in Pittsburgh, which, as we've said already, is a city where emergency pre-hospital medicine is, is handled by poorly trained, poorly equipped police officers who, should they pick you up, will put you in the back and close the doors and sit up front and you will ride and or die alone in the back. Glorified taxi and service. Glorified. I mean, by any by any measure, yeah. I'm sure and, there's uh, probably people making some comments right now. Wasn't well, that what EMS is anyway? That's why. Well, why do we sign up to take all these people? <laughs> they can just drive themselves to the hospital. <laughs> no, yeah, there's actually I mean, a reason. <laughs> there's certainly, uh, you know, the, the taxi joke is as is as old as ambulances for sure. Um, but this was legitimately uh, a we don't care or we don't even sit next to you taxi service. Zephyr knows that and he sees what's going on. Um, you know, he's sort of lived through a very personal tragedy and there's a very famous guy in the city of Pittsburgh, a former governor, a former mayor who dies publicly, uh, largely because uh, the care that he did not receive while the police were transporting him. So there's all this evidence. The city is aware of the evidence that white paper has been published. And so the world is kind of aware that there's a problem, but nobody has an answer. Zaffer being Zaffer says, fine, I've, I've got an answer. I'll, I'll do this thing. And so he, you know, he writes the, the curriculum and he, the, you know, an eight month paramedic training course complete with rotations in the ER, the OR, the ICU, the morgue, OB. I mean, anything is, in, you know, equally intense to what you would find today. He has no people to do it because, again, this job doesn't exist, but he's got the training course. He redesigns the ambulance. I mean, this is a really robust proposal. He just needs people to do it. This is your host, Christopher. If you like today's episode, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Also, click the bell for notifications on future content. If you haven't already, check out our website, theufcshow.com. Ways that you can support us and find us on other platforms. Until next time. 